This is a recording for the Club Pat Project. My name is Matthew O'Brien. Today is the 27th of July 2023 and I have here with me Gloria Binions. Thank you very much, Gloria. Um, can you just confirm for the recorder that you are happy to take part in this project? Yes, indeed. That's great. And if you don't mind, would you just spell your name for the recorder? Um, well, Gloria, that's G-L-O-R-I-A, and B-I-N-I-O-N-S. Perfect, Binions. that's great. That's great. Thanks, Gloria. Um, so, could you tell me maybe a little bit about your early life? Um, when and where were you born? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Cork City and then moved out to a place called Bishopstown and then met a Wexford man at a dance in Cork in 1963 and he brought me from the middle of the city eventually to the foot of the mountains, Blackstairs Mountains. So um, that's my beginning. I came here in 1976 to Killan Village, having lived in Dungarvan previously for 12 years. So 1976 in Killan. Brilliant. Um, and when you came from Dungarvan, what were kind of, did anything stand out to you or was life different in any way? Uh, dif yeah, different. Yeah, it was just, it was just slow moving and I was a bit worried about my interests in Calan, um, you know, suddenly being living near a town, from a city to a town, and then coming to rural Ireland. And the first thing I learned was to get rid of the three inch heels and get flat shoes, because it's a farming community. And um, so this is what I kind of found that difficult to adjust to. So my, fir my first interest is overwhelming interest is history, but also the stage, so I ended up in, uh, my interests were really in Enniscorthy, and then back to Calan Rathmuir to be involved with the stage and then history um, in the area. So. Um, and do you have any particular stories or does any, do any memories stand in from when you arrived and you mentioned getting rid of the three inch heels? Yeah, I remember arriving yeah, with the three inch heels and the mattress tied to the top of a van. That's, that's my memory of arriving in the village, not knowing anybody. And I was very lucky from my, my closest friend, um, Nancy Blackburn Riley, also arrived around the same time back from England but she was a native so she knew people around and um, then getting to know people in the area you know that was that was a slow process because the wonderful overwhelming interest he in the area was GAA and I wasn't involved in sports of of any description so then finding something to interest me and discovering Kelly and Kalan I was home and dried, so uh, my my all-consuming interests are with history. And when you arrived here first, would you say that you thought it was a welcoming place? I I thought uh, Grant once they got used to you, no problem. You know, it was uh, slow to get used to, possibly because my interest didn't lie at the time until I discovered, uh, you know, my, where my interests were. Uh, slow to. Uh, uh, it took me a year or two, and then fine. I was in Mark and Firm and the local uh, quiz teams and things like that. So, got very interested then in in local things. T tell me a little bit more about that. What 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 are the kind of activities that you get involved in on a local scale? Yeah, uh, well, on a local scale, I, I was involved. I was involved in the, my church, my, my church because uh, my Church of Ireland, and uh, was involved in the church and of course church activities as well. And um, then everything was everything. This is why I'm so un, uh, involved in promoting tourism in Kalan because everything was happening in Rathnewer or happening somewhere else or happening in Enniscorthy. So this, I would be very interested in promoting tourism here in relation to genealogy as well. You know, getting tourists back from looking for their great granny and hoping to help out with that end of it. So. That was, and then I started, started writing, collecting bits of local history, and way back in nineteen ninety seven, uh, did my first uh, book with locals, and collected as much history as I could, and just got it down on paper. That was in nineteen ninety seven, and from that then was involved in transcribing, doing covering the old graveyards, and going back as far as we could and collecting the history of the area and surrounding areas as well, mm. Kiltili, Rathenewer. 
very area. interesting. Yeah. Uh, did Did you know anything about the area before you, before you moved here? Not history wise, no, okay. no. And there I started, joined Bunclody Historical Society with my. Uh, my 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 mentors were two men called Rory Murphy and King Millen, and um, then every winter going to um, talks in New Ross, uh, Wexford Town, in Escorthy, and anything I could collect about local history. <laughs> every winter, well, there was something on nearly every week in local history in history societies. So just learned from from the beginning, you know, not the kind of school history, you know, that was different. That was just an overview of history, really. So you had to go on hopping up and down then to Dublin to research and trying to get information um, that you couldn't at the time get in Wexford Library. And now it's wonderful, you know, but uh, at that time, so progress then in and then getting into going to do a year's computer course for all for these so that was that was very important too. And and uh, you mentioned the Bunclody Historical Society. What kind of work would they do? Uh, would they be in the area regularly, or would they? Yeah, no. So we went to Bunclody to the. Is that what you mean? To the history area. Oh, so you, yeah. So so you went to Bunclody to the historical society there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I was. Uh, and were there any other kind of splinter groups maybe that emerged, or other historical societies in the area? Yeah, well, no, that was the only one in Bunclody at the time. That would have been the nearest one to me. And then there was one in New Ross, one in Enniscorthy, and one in Wexford Town as well. So there could have been others as well, but they, those were the ones I went to. And they, they, that's what I learned, what I do know. Okay. Um, and we'll come back to, to all of the, the historical interest. Um, but I'm just curious, how would you describe this area of Calam to somebody who hasn't been here before? Well, it it was very much, very much a farming community, and and uh, then life really. When this this sounds, well, life revolved really around the GAA in Rathnewr, and there was a local local pub called Conran's, and of course John Conran was well known in GAA circles, and there so you had records in Kilan. Life revolved around that. Now I'm not saying in a, but it was a social thing as well as as well as the odd drop of lemonade. Um, so records and then Conran's and then also the same happened in Kiltili and then of course the parish halls. Um, very much, um, I would be very much involved with, uh, from from an ecumenical point of view. I mean, people were very involved working together. Of people, deno- denominations didn't come into it, um, and. Uh, uh, people mix people of all denominations mix together and I mean if I was going say to a dance or a social it would be in Rathnewr Hall or something is happening in Killan and everybody bought tickets for to support uh, a church in Killan or support the church in Rathnewr so it was very much community Rathnewr, Kiltili and Killan and, and do you think that sense of community has changed over time? No I think it's it's it's, it's got better you know, it's wonderful, and young people, I mean, are absolutely marvellous. And um, they're all, I'm not saying people weren't always educated, but they're very young people are really with it, you know, and they travel, and they travel out, and they come back, and they know life outside the area. Like my own son, who unfortunately never came back once he got to Australia, but he comes back and forth. <laughs> so uh, wonderful young people involved, and are very involved now in promoting tourism and very interested in this project. Uh, absolutely, and um, we, we'll come back to that definitely later on. Um, in terms of change in the area, obviously you mentioned there's um, a larger young population now. Um, have, has there been any other change in the area caused by maybe technology, transport, maybe politics? Yeah, transport. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be too sure on the politics end of it, but I think that um, transport is a thing, you see, that unless you have a car, okay, in the area, there's one bus on a Wednesday, okay? Now you can get a bus on a Friday as well if you if you, if you if you'd, um, order it up yourself. You have to ring and see that it comes on a Friday. But say it would only be twice a week 
that you unless you have transport that is a problem and um it's a problem for the for the villages in the area and local link now of course that's that's a progress great progress in local link so that 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 is what's different from the time I arrived for so you had to have a car really yeah mm -hmm. um and you mentioned that the primary kind of um output I suppose in Canada would be farming Oh, indeed. Um, what yeah. other kind of work do people from Clan do? Indeed. Well, they, they go, they go, you get um, people working in hospitals, you get people. What's needed here, I always thought, when I found kind of, no jobs for women unless you had a car at that time. I'm talking about a time period way back now, 70s, 80s. But um, um, it would be wonderful if tourism you know, involved employing women because it is a farming community. Otherwise, you are working in, I mean, New Ross, Waterford, um, Buntlody, um, Carlow, even, you know, driving from here. So um, we need, need tourism, we need employment. Other, I mean, farming is, of course, is involved as well, you know, and can be involved as well. But uh, we need... Uh, I'm not saying I, I dare not say we need industry, but we need jobs of some form relating to tourism. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I'm I'm interested. Um, how did you kind of develop your interest in local history, um, and local people and and the place of Clan? How did that interest? Yeah. Develop? Well, I I was only for local people. I mean, I would go to the oldest person and seek out the oldest person and sit with them and write down what they told me. But um, I'm very fussy about separating folklore from fact, you know, because you get facts, what are supposed to be fact. And I, I, I got a great hint from a great man called Rory Murphy when I was writing anything. He said, always, if you're not sure that is completely true, put down according to local tradition. <laughs> and that gets you out of everything, right? According to local tradition, that's very safe. So I would like to, folklore is very important, but to, to just separate it from fact when you're writing anything, so. And could you speak a little bit more maybe about folklore and tales of folklore in Calam? Yeah, lo lots of folklore and lots of traditions of you know relating to animals and and um, customs relating to bringing say with animals out of fields at certain times or doing something yeah th those were things that were I wouldn't have known about having grown up in a city I wouldn't have known about and could you tell us a little bit more about some of that the those tales, those folk tales or and again specific to kind of collect. Yeah, well some of the local writings you have you have Patrick Kennedy did wonderful stuff and he wrote he wrote now he wrote it many years later, but he wrote it about the area uh, in eighteen thirteen, that time period. So Patrick Kennedy is one of uh, one of our great writers. You have books like Evenings in the Duffery and Banks of the Bora and they, those are one of the older writers. And then you have a modern writer, Mark Codd, a wonderful book on Kelly and Callan in 1798, as well as all the other little bits and pieces that I did or that other people did. So um, putting it all together then is wonderful. And with folklore, I mean, pe people will take it anyway, whatever way they want to take it, you know, but it, it's very important that it's there, you know, to, uh, stories that are handed down. So. Uh, and what are... Uh, to your mind, kind of some of the most important events in Calan's past? Well, very definitely, uh, the 98 Rebellion is absolutely huge because it was the biggest, um, the, the Barony of Bantry, which is the old Norman bar uh, Barony, the Barony of Bantry sent more uh, fighters to, for instance, the Battle of Ross. There was a um, at least 500, if not, some people say a 1,000 by the time they got to Ross. So the more pikemen than in any other barony in the in the County Wexford um, fought. So that's very important locally. And Kelly is very important locally, you know, and it wasn't 
you know, it is, when people say it was a peasant rebellion, it wasn't. There were, I mean, you have people like Kelly, you have his cousin, Father Mo Kearns in Kiltili, you have um, uh, Thomas Cloney, and people of that calibre who were leading the, the rebellion. So very important. History is very important in Kilan. And do you think there are any key events that people talked about quite regularly? Local people talked about quite regularly. Yeah, well, again, again, it would be history because very involved civil war comes very much into it. And recently researching on 1920, 1921, and um, of course 1916, the happenings in Enniscorthy, and local people amazing how they're how they remember and they you know collect stories from passed on and again i'm kind of into researching those you know and trying to prove what exactly was right if ever we we get to that but uh, that's very important Res- doing re- new research i think is important as well absolutely um mm-hmm. and is there any story that stands out that you found particularly interesting I, I, uh, if I may be personal about it, I, I discovered that where you're sitting now is the first post office in Killan, right? And I only discovered that some years ago. Uh, discovered through the marks here, that was that door there that's now a cupboard. That was actually the front door of the first post office in Killan. Yeah. So uh, things like that are fascinating to me. And that moved, I reckon... Of course, this building has all been added to now. It's been added this way and that way. So in 1860, we know that the post office had moved down. But about 1840, this is the site of the first post office. And um, they, I reckon there could even have been a little bit older building. But I think that is fascinating to think that, uh, you know, people of that time period have come in and out here. And this was the post box. The, the big wide window here was where they posted their letters. So that, that was fascinating to me so that we kind of get an idea of the layout of the village. You know, you have Kelly's Doyle's uh, on the corner, passed on to Doyle's, the Kelly relations. So we have it completely tracked from 1770 to present day, the building on the corner there. So um, you have Kelly's, Doyle's, and then if this was the post office, so it's giving us a good idea of the layout of the village at the time period. And it was thriving, you see, life revolved around the church. You have St Anne's Church of Ireland, life revolved, and then um, around the 1870s, the church, there was always a, a Catholic church in Rathnure village, but basically then this was the Protestant end of the parish at that stage, and then Rathnure, uh, life revolved around the church then in Rathnure, as it did with most Irish villages. So um, from that point of view, there was all always a linkage. We even have, have discovered through a, an old lady I discovered about 40 years ago, a wonderful old lady, who was able to tell me where the unmarked grave in Rathnewer was of a guy who went with Kelly to Vinegar Hill to the battle of uh, on, on went in um, May of 1798. So she was, now nobody else could tell me that. I said, I'm looking for the grave of a guy who whose family are buried in both cemeteries there. The, the family was called Graham and they were both Church of Ireland and Catholic family. But this guy called Chapman Graham went, um, with, we know that for certain, to Vinegar Hill with John Kelly. And he died in 1847. He lived till 1847. And this old lady was able to tell me where the Graham grave was, which he's obviously buried in. That was the family grave, but it was never marked. And this is where now Gloria wants... Gloria was wound up to get little blue plaques all over the place for for recording all this and that's what I would love to do with the tourist trail that you're trying to get saying the pikes were forged here that is done now there's a little granite stone here uh, um, putting plaques everywhere where these people lived because because in 50 years time if those houses will be knocked and no one will know where they lived you know, so I would very part of my project <laughs> would come back to get these places marked. So and this this um this winter another lady and myself are hoping to track 
go to all the old houses and find out how far back what houses were on that site and I think that would be very important to pass on that kind of thing so we're going to do that project now a voluntary project for the winter keep our brains from rusting and um, so that's the project for the winter and could you tell me a little more about the plaque kind of initiative sorry no but you know those blue 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 plaques yeah that's that's you know that's what we would like to mark where people lived 200 years ago you know so people who are important in history for the area Uh, and when did you start or when did you embark on that yeah, we we're only going to do it this winter. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's we're hoping for a little few bob from somebody. <laughs> and will you put one on your door here? Being Indeed. The first post well, office? I hope they would. Uh, yeah, I hope they would do that, saying that this was the site of the first post office. Yeah, right. that would um, be marvelous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, were there any big local celebrations or events when you were kind of, um, I suppose, when you moved here? I'm 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 just trying to think of what what uh, local celebrations. Uh, you mean in connection? Do you mean in connection with? Sorry, what do you mean actually? Just just in terms of um, marking maybe uh, local anniversaries or maybe any farming traditions like harvest traditions, um, anything like that, or anything in from folklore or history. Yeah, that yeah what they do with farming traditions now, which, which I think is marvelous. They they do tractor runs. I think that's great on Sunday. So you you get these very ancient tractors and tractor runs. I think that's lovely. You know that that's a very important tradition. So you have um, where you have the farming community, and because it is a farming community, and what my my husband who wasn't a, a farmer, uh, who um, we were ne- we were never farming, but he used to love going down to the pub, and everyone we I always knew when they, somebody had uh, another lamb or uh, um, something was happening in calving or what was happening. I was learning about farming as well when I came here because I didn't know anything about farming. So um, you know, the, but but again, all these things were discussed in local pubs, really, and a community hall, of course, is wonderful in Radnor. And the, this was, this is the parish hall here, where everything happens now as well. And even last night now, everybody has a passion tea in the Church of Ireland hall. So that that's the sort of community it is, you know. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Yeah. And were, are there any major historical events marked maybe on a yearly basis or? Yeah, yeah, no, no, very, very much so. We we would go, you know, people here would go to Vinegar Hill, people who were involved in the 98 commemoration. That's commemorated every year. The 98 is very much Wexford. Uh, yeah, that's commemorated every year. And, um, I mean, the whole village is connected with history because the RIC barracks was the one on the corner, that's still there. And... Um, all, all sorts of. I mean, I remember finding a, a little down low on a building, seventeen sixty seven. You know, you wouldn't know these things. This was way up at Old Town, which was the old town of Killan uh, before the. They call this the new line, which was built two hundred years ago. This is the new line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, very much but it's probably because my overwhelming interest in history it just this place just reeks history you know and and given your connection to the history of the area do you think that there's any episodes from Calan's past that maybe haven't been talked about or documented I I, I suppose you know uh, the the connections between we have you have three Anglo Irish houses in the area, and you have a Blackers a Woodbrook and that from a, a point of view I mean Blackers are very much connected with the Orange Order, and that would be uh, the other side of history, and so you have um, Blackers of Woodbrook, and you had um, Coolborn connected with the Bruin family that was after that wasn't built until after the rebellion, but. Um, and Monk's Grange, which is very much connected with the uh, 1798 and the rebellion. Protestant families actually went there for protection in 98 and went out. There was 15 or 16 carts of, we know some of the people that were on the carts went out from uh, Monk's Grange House into New Ross for protection. So it's very much connected with, uh, with 98. 
um, yeah, the, the, yeah, the three houses were Coolborn, Woodbrook, and Monk's Grange. Um, would you be in, or would you be um, a part of maybe organising or involved in any way with some of these kind of commemorations or celebrations? Well, uh, yeah, I was involved with Monk's Grange, had their 250th anniversary there, so I was involved with that, yeah. And again, Again, all local people are involved with everything. You know, there's no such thing as separate units now like like there was 200 years ago, very much so. So there's the, that healing has had, you know, going on for 200 years. Yeah. And are there any other interesting stories from the area? Or what, what's your favourite story from, from this area? Uh, it would definitely be Kelly. It would have to be Kelly because he was connected with the Redmond families, the Doyle families, and people like, I remember when when we were organising pikers for the 250th, one of the people, I piked all over Ireland in 1998 with, with the Carrick Byrne Pike Group. We were all over Ireland and in New York and in Savannah. <laughs> and um, then another group went to Newfoundland, you know, connections with 98. And, um, uh, but I remember this man saying to me, w- we were announcing as many, uh, people that we knew were definitely died in 98, hundreds died that we'll never know their names. But I remember he said to me, um, I was announcing a name called uh, John Whelan of Fairview, and he was his ancestor. And he came to me and said, can I pike with you and Kalan on the 225th anniversary? Huge connections, you know, with people. And people are wonderful in America and abroad who had probably know more about their families than we do here you know and they bring information in with us and this is this is where I would be very involved in doing something like um, come and find your great granny in the Killan Blackstairs area this would be huge for tourism you know uh, uh, for people coming home homecoming another thing I think we must get we must do is get more what we need badly is um b and b's and accommodation and which records are going to do in time themselves they're going to provide accommodation but we need more accommodation provided for tours that's very important and to get them to get them to stay in the area you know for a few days get them to stay in the area and provide then uh, Records being reopening is wonderful for us, you know, so that's very important. Absolutely. Um, and just on the, on, the, on the topic of tourism, I suppose, how would you view the current kind of state of tourism in Calan and maybe the broader Blackstairs kind of area? Yeah, you see, it's, it's, uh, uh, you, need to, you need to find what people are interested in. You know whether it is walking, whether it is uh, the uh, ecology of the you mu- you must find out what people are interested in, and then do a combination of everything. That's that's very important. Some people are just not interested in history, but you know that's very important. And here genealogy comes into it. If we can do their family trees, uh, there are a, v- a couple of young people now very interested. A couple of young people very interested in continuing helping out with genealogy. And, um, and and indeed local history. Okay. Um, and what would some of the benefits of, I suppose, tourism be to an area like Canaan? Yeah, well, see, uh, very important. That B&B end of it is very important. That would be a great source of income uh, for, for women, women who could work at that. Uh, maybe while daddy's on the farm as well if daddy has a small farm you know the husband has a small farm that would be a great source of income um, we really need to push tourism a lot more lots of books on the area that can be uh, suggested um, you have you know somebody a member somebody arriving from Belfast one day saying to me I'm looking for Maura O'Neill's grave. Now, Maura O'Neill would be well known in Northern Ireland as a writer. She was mother of Molly Keane, who was a writer, and she is buried in Killan. And coming to me years ago, people like that were most helpful because I didn't know at the time where Maura O'Neill was buried. Now I discovered where Maura O'Neill was buried. And, and um, 
so so things like that. There were other the three or two other writers buried in that uh, Adela Orpen, who was of the Monk's Grange family, was also a writer. Uh, she's buried there as well. So um, all these things adding up, we actually have a. Um, Lieutenant, uh, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. I'm the na- the year isn't coming back to me now, but he was christened down there. A guy called Brewster. He was christened in the tiny little thatched church in Killan. Well, all these would, you know, we need to branch out, and that would be of interest to people who are coming from England or who are interested in Anglo Irish history, whatever. Yeah. Um. Away from the kind of historical. Or, or I suppose we can include the historical as well in that. Um, which maybe sites or trails or locations um, uh, do you think the tourists visit most in the Black Stairs Mountains? Well, I, I mean, there's an awful lot of people who are just into locals too, who are into mountain climbing, right? That that particular area. But I'm just wondering where do Copat in, envisage a trail connecting Kiltili? along the uh, black stairs do, do, is that what they envisage doing um you know we we would we would hope that that's what's happening that that they would connect the um, Kiltili trail onto Kalan and then we can provide all the history for that area <laughs> back to history yeah, yeah. Um, that would be marvelous yeah um and and in general what do you think the um, local perception of tourism is within Calam at the moment. Yeah, I would think very interesting now because farmers are beginning to to branch out as well, and I think this is not what something they were willing to do when I arrived here in nineteen seventy six. You know, it was farming and farming, and I think, I think they would be much more interested now in in doing something different. You know, I. And farming probably isn't this profit. I don't know anything about farming, but probably not as profitable, maybe as it was then. So I I would think it would be of great interest to. Uh, again, I'm I'm probably emphasizing women too much, but employment for women or something they can do. I think it's very important. And and that's what that kind of brings me to my next question on um, what role do you think that upland communities can play in developing? Tourism. I mean, you're involved, or you're going to be involved in mm. this plaque project. Mm. Mm. Are you aware of, or do you think there are any other things that can be any other avenues that could be pursued or tapped into? No, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just really interested in that because it's, it's lately, it's, um, it's very important. I, I'm on several groups there on Facebook, and people are very, very interested in, in finding their ancestors. I think this is one, just one, uh, you know, this one that that would help that uh, people who came here would would um, it would involve re- researching their family tree and somebody that could help them to do that. I think that's just one line that would, you know, that would be very um, useful here for people. And how do you think, in your experience to date, is social media the best way to do that to try and appeal to people? Yeah, well, trying to get what we're trying to do in the groups on social media is, or trying to do is get a meet and greet situation so that if somebody is wants to walk along the foot of the mountain or walk in the area or come to do history in the area, that they'll find great great granny as well. And the, the location of their, her, their houses, which we're working on this, um, this winter. So. You, I, sorry, sorry, no, sorry no, Matthew. Yeah, I, I have actually, I've seen people, a lady arrived here at my door, they kind of all send them down to me, you know, the, the blow in from Cork, but anyway, <laughs> they send them down. this lady arrived and she said, I've been up around there and nobody ever heard of um, Paramount House, which was where, which was up in Askin Villa, Springmount area, and uh, she said, "Do you know I mean she just asked people, and not, uh, probably a young person, or people who wouldn't have known?" And uh, she said, "Nobody ever heard of Permata." Took her up there, and with permission of the landowner, took her in, and she saw one tree growing. I can't remember what it was. Probably a tree that was left, you know, that the farmer there. And she knew from a photograph from way back 
that it was her great great grandfather or whatever planted that tree and she just stood there with tears rolling down her cheeks and just I was looking in amazement at her because I realised how emotional it can be to find, you know, your ancestors' information. And um, she was just so overwhelmed by being to the place where he had been. You know, that kind of thing now I think is very important to the uh, tourism. And there's another lady very involved who lives up in that area, is very involved in tracking uh, relations as well. And she's she's very happy to help out as well. So we have people in different areas who were interested in that. And that would be, that would connect the Kiltili area to us so we could incorporate that, you know, checking information on people's ancestors and where they lived at the time period. And you mentioned that this particular genealogical kind of pursuit will be of interest to a lot of people who are living in England um, uh, and elsewhere. Oh, completely. Is, yeah. Is, is there anywhere else that is, has anyone come to you from f- further afield? Oh, absolutely. Everywhere. Canada, America, Australia. They call her. And there's no facility locally. Now, libraries are brilliant, but libraries in Wexford Town are not going to be able to tell them where Great Granny lived. <laughs> you know, so, so that's where. Lo- I think local historians come in very, very useful. Yeah, yeah. And do you have any interesting stories from the people you've met? I mean, you've already told us a couple, but are there any other stories of people finding, you know, their roots? Oh, they- yeah. And they're, they're, they're absolutely so grateful. And you see, they bring information as well that we, we I have lo- loads of handwritten stuff which has been passed on and papers from pre-computer days that there I'm at a bit of a disadvantage and that I did a year's computer course and have enough knowledge just to get by but no more you know so not not a hundred percent computer literate at all but but can pass on that information I, I already have the book sorted out because I am now 82 years of age so I have who's getting what books with the three people that are interested so I'm passing on all that information so that they can carry on the work you know so maybe and maybe get more make money out of it <laughs> it would be very useful yeah yeah um if, if, I'm just curious if you could pick kind of one side from Kamarm or indeed the surrounding area to showcase to a group of tourists who maybe aren't necessarily coming over to find their relatives yeah. What would that be? What yeah. site would that well, be? Well, I would first say absolute peace and quiet. I mean, I go for a walk there. Used to used to go for walks there, where you would not see a car or maybe even a human being. You know, just the walks around here are amazing. If you're into walks, mountain climbing, if you're into GAA, would be a very you know uh, the record um, so important that record information with again I mean Rathnur is only a mile and a half away so you know they're very much connected they're very much twin villages if you like and um, again you get interest with uh, uh, people. But the, this this involves genealogy, of course. But you get people interested to see the churches, like Rathnorkelan, where our ancestors uh, came from, and gra- and of course graveyard. Again, that's all in that line and tracking your ancestors. But the, gr- the graves here in this go back to uh, seventeen twenty nine was the last one we found. A lot of them are sinking underground. So we 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 discovered. Just before the 1998 commemorations, we discovered by going round, um, tapping the ground, we just discovered one of the graves of uh, a 98, another 98 grave. So things are things are happening all the time, you know, in relation to 98, and uh, more information coming through. Also, uh, what is happening now is we are not, you're not saying one side of history or the other. What is happening now is this guy was killed on Vinegar Hill. What side is on we don't we don't <laughs> we don't know he the man was killed, right? And that's what we want to get at now. We just want to get the truth out uh, as near as possible to the truth about what happened and relating it to Killan then again. So okay. you mentioned um uh, you go you, you went for used to go for walks 
in yeah. the area and you had the peace and quiet. Yeah. Um, did you spend much time kind of walking in the uplands? No, I didn't. Okay. I didn't because because of uh, no, no. I'm a flat surface walker. I'm afraid I'm a flat surface walker. But but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have any very little knowledge on that. You know, the local man here does an awful lot of walking up the Cherhulan, and Cher is um. You probably probably have been talking to Cher, or will be talking to Cher, but he's he's the one who's the expert on that. He lives up in in Rathdoff here. Okay. So. Um, and. In terms of you, you mentioned earlier about fact and folklore, um, and you mentioned kind of about the, the folklore surrounding you know trees and flowers and other kind of um, elements of, of the natural habitat. Yeah. Um, are there any in particular any kind of pieces of folklore that you could share with me now about any any of those individual things? No, off the top of my head, I I I can't. I, off the top of my head. Now, you know, folklore that I and um, um, Michael, oh sorry, I've forgotten the gentleman's other name, isn't that awful? Of them ever, he, uh, he, he does an awful lot of that on, on Facebook, but I would not be at all be able to. Uh, and that's because I'm, I'm as they call us here, a townie, you know? That's because I'm a townie. I wouldn't be familiar with, with all the old customs or folklore handed down um, and even just um, sorry Michael Fortune is the gentleman's name I'm trying to think of okay. yeah yeah yeah, Great, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, even when you were on walks and you mentioned the kind of peace and quiet did you ever have a kind of a favourite tree or a plant or even an animal or an insect did you ever have a, a favourite um, I suppose local um, animal insect or, or plant or tree well, you see, you see, I love plants and I love my garden. I love my back. I love my garden. Right? I, I'm uh, I, I'm interested in all plants and I love trees and plants. But as regards a local tradition relating to them, I would not know. I would I would be telling a fib if I said no because I don't know. So that's understandable. Um, in the area, would you have any kind of um? knowledge or connection in any way to uh, any of the kind of archaeological sites um, or that exist I suppose in the coastal Oakland areas? No, I'm afraid not. and again we have, you see we have another local expert on that which would be R Rory O'Connor who has trained in, in, in I so, so no, I, I wouldn't either I'm afraid, I wouldn't. That's right even even from a historical, well, I'm very interested and and would be, be very very interested in digs and all that, but wouldn't have no knowledge of whatsoever. You know. uh, and are there any in the area that that you know of that are that do hold significance for people? Yeah, the ones the ones that I know are very important is what they call fairy forts. You know, the the very important indeed, and they would be very. Well, now the word I don't want to use is superstitious, but local tradition again, you know, that they wouldn't just, uh, wouldn't touch them at all, you know, so there have been several in the area, I know of one in particular between here and, and it's never touched, you know, it's just uh, left as it was, and that's between here and Rathneo, but there were several, I remember the several on, the, I have a lot of old maps and the several on, on them, but they're uh, all very, very sacred to people locally. They're, and I wonder, in terms of you mentioned the younger kind of generations who are coming through um, mm -hmm. in Kilan now, do you think they will be aware of those kind of local? Y yes, traditions? I do, and I think that it's being it's being passed on. Last night was a perfect example at the local passion here was Saint Anne's Day, and um, there were young people there and young people learning again about history at school and about yeah wonderful and and passed on as well you know um, definitely people passing on local traditions and are there any other pieces of local folklore or tradition that you can tell me about um i'm t i i'm i'm just I I'm just trying to think. You see, I, 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 um, off the top of my head, I'm just trying to think of lo local. But uh, here, here again, I'm sorry to say that that wouldn't be me either. I'm very much into history and fact, um, so I'm afraid that that wouldn't be me. You know that. I wonder, could you even tell me? You mentioned obviously yes, the fact and the folklore. Um, 
Could you tell me a little bit more about that and the importance of maybe... Yeah, I mean, th- th- I tell you that f- um, things that are not known, for instance, was, um, uh, it was to my surprise that I found John Kelly's fa- father's signature in the Church of Ireland registers, right? <laughs> he was um, fr- intermittently from 1772 until he died in 1797. He was church warden in the Church of Ireland Church, and that came as a surprise uh, to some people, cause, just because it didn't fit in with uh, history, but it is a fact. Uh, you know, so um, very likely John Kelly's father was a Protestant, um, and his uh, none of his um, children's baptismal records at all are in. His lady wife was Mary Redmond, and none of his children's um, baptismal records are in the Church of Ireland records at all. But uh, it is a fact that uh, John Kelly's father was Church of Ireland. So that's just something that kind of it doesn't fit in with the normal. We like things in Ireland to fit in. So I'm delighted that doesn't fit in, you know, so because the United Irishmen were a lot of very important Protestants in the United Irishmen. So again, I would very much like to see people coming from Northern Ireland, which they do, and coming from Northern Ireland to to connect up with the, with the, the history of where many several Presbyterian we've had we've had those people coming to a relation of a Presbyterian minister who was executed in Northern Ireland. Again this connects with the priests being executed here, so seventeen ninety eight rebellion, including all aspects of that. You know. Back to the rebellion. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier about um was it piking? Um mm. your work with the pike yeah, that's that's commemoration. There again, this gets families involved and young people involved, you know. So we everybody was honoured. I was in a pike group. Um, we had our own Calan pike group. We also connected up with a pike group called um, Carrick Burn Pike Group. A man, great ma- late man who's not no longer with us, Bill Murray, and uh, we went all over, honoured everybody, Protestant, Catholic, dissenter. Probably agnostics as well uh, acknowledged anyone who gave their lives in ninety eight, and that was a very combining factor for me, you know that that um, people everybody was honoured who got up and did their best to right wrongs of the time period, so um, and then then every year uh, commemorated the battle of Enniscorthy, the battle of Inigo Hill, is the end of the rebellion. The battle of Enniscorthy was the first battle. So there again, we all go in with our pikes. My pike is out there, and it's it's. Uh, they tell me it's going up in records because it was carried in New York and it was carried, you know, all over. So here again, records and hurling, and ninety eight all fits in, so well with with records and, and the gray the the graves that go back so far the old cemeteries, wonderful. <laughs> And there'd be a strong community then, I mean, international oh, community with, ab- with the, the pikers. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And they've been to Newfoundland is a very important area because huge connections with Wexford with the fishing. And and uh, Newfoundland are very important. Savannah, another important one. This, I think it's the second biggest parade in America after New York. Savannah, Georgia. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So... Uh, again potential there just for potential just for bringing people back into the area you know and could you tell me a little bit more about the reenactments I'm, I'm very interested in that that's sorry which the reenactments or the, the uh, at Monk's Grange was it yeah. yeah that that was an amazing night and sadly for some reason we because at the time I was 25 years ago Everything is covered now, you know, and easier to do that. There's not a huge coverage of it, but we have some. Um, Jeremy Hill gave permission for us to um, to reenact uh, the whole thing. What I did was, um, I, I wrote a script taking it back as far as the monks' uh, time uh, at Monks Grange, okay, the Cistercian time back as far as there and did little scenes bringing it right up to date right up to the European Union okay so it wasn't just about 98 we did it on the night before the battle of New Ross 
and decided that we were going to march, do the march all night from Monks Grange into New Ross to, to get there from the time the rebellion started in New Ross 200 years previously, right? Now, that didn't happen. I'm afraid we, we, we took shortcuts. We got into cars after Monks Grange, right? But got as far as New Ross in the middle of the night and had permission from the police, from the guards, to to march silently in New Ross to where Bagnell Harvey and exact spots and everything was all sorted out. But getting back to Monks Grange, it was amazing. They came from all over Wexford. Um, the the open air pageant we reenacted the Battle of Ross on the lawns of Monks Grange, and reenacted it. Reenacted. Um, the the lady of the house running out of the house, you know, with the baby and the the the, the silver under her arm. She she was a great woman. She wasn't going to leave the silver after her. I wouldn't have either. And um, reenacted all that and uh, and the family, the Richards family, very much involved. The Richards, Orpens Hills, so the the lineage there, and the tenth generation are in that house, yeah. and um, so they were very much involved. We had the FCA, FCA. Uh, Guard of Honour and uh, all were there, raised the flag in Monk's Grange and um, it, it was a wonderful, absolutely wonderful evening and it's still you know engraved here in my memory. I have the programme somewhere of very interesting and uh, we had local musicians. We brought it right up, included everything. We had a Michael Collins scene from 1922, you know, that time period and uh, uh, it was a wonderful. We got help from. Now I'm trying to think of the name of the people that helped us out at the time. They were, uh, they were in Johnstone Castle. We got we got a few bob to do it, and there was a huge, huge platform in front of Monk's Grange House, and the whole thing was reenacted on the platform in front of the house. So that was very, um, to me, very emotional at the time. And I think Jeremy Hill was emotional about it as well. <laughs> it was. Uh, and it was wonderful to get permission. Huge problems. We had to get insurance to cover horses. We had our horsemen, our pikemen, our swordsmen, and everything. So that was a that was a wonderful thing locally and ver- involving everybody. And was there a big community kind of response? Oh, huge, huge, absolutely huge. And the pantomime society that I. One time I used to produce it years ago, so we had all the cast of, you know, involved doing whatever we wanted to do. They were the ones that involved. We had, we had going right back, we had the monks coming out. The monks Greg, of Greg Namana owned all the land here. The Cistercians owned the land. So we, we had a connection there with Greg Namana. We had the monks coming out chanting. That was the opening bit and then brought it right up to, the, brought the pageant right up as well as including the, the Battle of Ross, uh, we had um, guns going off and all, all permission granted and everything, all about board. But it was a wonder, wonderful. We have, we do have a video of the FCA marching up, um, uh, like we did uh, for the two hundred and twenty fifth commemoration. It was a wonderful, wonderful evening. And what was your what what stood out to you most? I suppose from that experience. Sorry, what? What stood out to you most, or what? What, what, what stood out to me most is I can st- still see the tricolour coming up with the marching. That for me was extremely emotional because I'm, I'm a great nationalist, not with a gun, just a nationalist, no guns, and that was very emotional for me, and um, be, being involved and being able to be involved, but um, yeah, you c- you can gather that I have a great love for Calan and its history. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned as well um, that you were involved with pantomime. Yes, the pantomime societies in Rathney Ward, that's wonderful for kids, you know, wonderful. And John Riley is the present, uh, produces the pantomime, John Riley and Liam Sharkey produce the pantomime, and um, uh, that's that's going on every year. That helps out every way. It helps out with funding for the parish, for the church in Rathney Ward. And I, I mean, I can't underestimate the local parish hall. It's wonderful, you know, the local um, priest, clergy, whatever, uh, involved uh, with everything and life, life revolving around, around that and the local hostelries as well, you know, where people gathered. Uh, very necessary, you know, very necessary. Um, 
but um, Rath, yeah, Rathnewer, it's all happening in Rathnewer. They have everything. I mean, there's everything down there from sports facilities. So that's that's where that happens in the Rathnewer end of it. You know, we're we're the history people up here. <laughs> and what's the best thing about living in Kamal? Oh, living living here is absolutely wonderful. Sometimes I feel. If you go back, this is only because for older people, we'll say, that I would prefer to be living nearer a town. That's just facilities that you need near a town. But the absolute advantage of living here and the peace and quiet and kind of coming and going, knowing everybody, it's wonderful, you know, to be, to just to live here and you know or have connections with everybody. I mean, couldn't have better neighbours and it's that sort of place. You know, and uh, they don't bother you, but when you're in trouble, they're at the other end of a phone, so which is very important. But uh, uh, oh, certainly living, and it's going to it's going to get more crowded now because it's going to kind of be used as a dormitory town for an escorty, New Ross and Bunclody. The was if they can get you know sites and build here, but but it's really going to blossom. I mean, we need we need. What I'm saying is, we need it from a tourism point of view. We need accommodation. Uh, uh, that's what we need, and we we need employment, particularly for women. I think you know, yeah. that's just that's just from a woman's point of view. I'm sure we'll be great for men as well, employment for men as well. We don't want to make it either. You see, avoiding the 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 factories and the whatever you know. Yeah. So. If I was to ask you then, what challenges do you think that Calam will face, say in the short or indeed the long term future? What do you think that might be? Oh dear, the long term future. Oh dear, the long term future would be the war. <laughs> See, the worry that it gets built up and and uh, you know like and it becomes another town. You know, that that would be the worry. And we hope, just hope, that the farming survives and is aided, uh, is aided as well, you know, survival. Uh, just so kids can stay in the area. And this was, I just take an, as an example, my own son, who didn't inherit a farm, you know, and it, it's fine if your son, and then again, if you have a couple of sons, they're not all going to be involved in farming. But uh, transport is another thing very important uh, that there should be daily transport at the, you know at some stage and uh, and again for older people i just come across older people who don't drive and so they're stuck you know but transport is very important transport employment very important and it's absolutely i mean is it a, a tourist haven as regards mountain walks and peaceful areas the tourist haven yeah um what does it mean to you to be living and I suppose indeed working in this area? It would be wonderful if everybody could live and work here. That would be amazing. That that would just be amazing. So this is why uh, employment is vital. Um, you know, and just just a question mark i just hope that it works out for farming community you know if it doesn't you need something else you know so this is this is why this is why i think tourism is so important yeah so i hope that hope that all happens and is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you'd like to talk about well now <sighs> I'm I'm just trying to um I I'm just I'm just I I uh, what th there's one thing that's very th that's very important um I would like you see I would like to see something compiled so that people who are interested in coming here right Right, we need to know what's available. Now that seems a very simple thing, but somebody to combine that if your interest is GAA, it's locally, if your interest is mountain walking, uh, or whatever it is, if your interest is genealogy, if you're interested in 
history in general, or ninety eight in general, that I I would like something compiled by somebody. I'm just a little bit too old to do it now, but somebody would compile what's available for tourists, what accommodation will be available for tourists to promote the area. I mean, that would that would just be my wish for the area. What what more can you can you say? Only wish that the area progresses and that people people can live and stay here, and there's some of their sons and daughters can stay here as well. An awful lot lot of emigration to Australia seems to be a magnet, you know, for some sons and daughters around here. Thankfully, some of them are coming back and building here in, in the area and coming back, you know, making their little few bob in Australia and coming home, which is which is great. But here again, they, they have to find employment uh, somewhere and transport if you do find employment. And the areas, of course, are employment were Bunclod in your ass and uh, the, the town, Enniscorthy, the town surrounding us. Um, and the pe- people at that end of the parish in uh, uh, Rathnewar tend to um, work or shop in New Ross and the same you know, from just from a distance point of view that it's the nearest place to them you know um, that's about it just to promote um, Kilam and have a centre to gather where we have records now again and that will that will expand in time wonderful for local people to take it on amazing and, uh, and there again a source of entertainment at weekends as well you know so and especially for me, can when I can come out and walk home and have a drop of lemonade if I want to and walk home. But uh, for for journey for local people again, it'll have to be all sorted out, which is which it is and will be sorted out that people can get um, uh, transport home, people who come to entertainment in Kilan, you know, and what was when Bobby Rackard was in charge there. Uh, that's what used to happen. Buses used to come out from Enniscorthy, connecting buses when there was discos or whatever was on, you know. So again, that's uh, that's all in the future and can be done now that it's open. So I think that's about my wish for Calan that it progresses and you know that I can look down and see all these these things happening. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I don't. I don't think there is really because it's uh, anything that I have because of my huge interest in uh, history. I think that's. I think that's about it, and would be would be very interested in the. Uh, would be very interested in in the walks. I think it's wonderful because people are really into walks now, aren't they? In, yeah, walks all around here. Walks in the woods. You know, the, the, um, that that would be great. If, if if that we need you again, it's about money. Is you need some help with these things, you know, to get it going, and then and then taking her, uh, taking it from there. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much, Gloria. Um, and I'll just stop the recording now.